Hello, everybody, and welcome to this APN webinar. Uh, I am Dar Suskind. I'm the president and CEO. I will introduce my colleagues in uh, just a moment. But for those of you who are regulars on our webinar, you know that this is the part where I uh, partake in the time-honored Washington tradition of filibustering, because it takes a moment or two for everyone to get logged in. Um, we're expecting a good crowd today. I can see the numbers rising, but it takes a minute. So thank you all for your patience and thank you for, for being the prompt people who are here on time. Um, in just one moment, we will get everything started. Okay, we're rolling up here. Um, so once again, I will say hello, welcome, thank you. Uh, for those of you just joining in, I'm Hadar Suskind. I'm the president and CEO of Americans for Peace Now. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I have here with me two of my esteemed colleagues, uh, our Director of Government Relations here at APN, Mar Madeline Cherodino. Hello, Madeline. <laughs> little wave at the crowd. And our special guests today, um, many of you, of course, know Hagit Ofran, who is the co-director of Shalom Akshav's Settlement Watch program. And in a moment, we will hear more from, uh, from Hagit and then from Madeline as well. Um, before we do that, just quick housekeeping notes. Uh, I want to remind everyone this is recorded, and we will be sharing the recording um, as well as using the audio to make a podcast episode and sharing the transcript as well. So if you uh, want to share it with folks later, come back and listen again because it's so fun. You will have that opportunity. Um, we will get to a Q&A period. Uh, when the time comes, I ask you that you use the Q&A button, the function at the bottom of your screen, and type in your questions. Try to Keep them short and try to please keep them focused on the topic of our conversation today. Uh, we will get to as many of them as we possibly can. If there are questions that we don't manage to get to today, uh, we will share them with Hagit and we will uh, happily answer them however we can. So um, with that, again, hello and welcome everybody. Uh, we're here today specifically to talk about uh, the 2023 Settlement Watch report that Shana Makhshav recently uh, released. It is really the most comprehensive uh, and deepest document about settlement activity and settlement growth in the year. Um, this past year, you know, by any standard, the findings were, were terrible and disturbing. Uh, again, even considering Netanyahu's far-right, settler-led government um, obviously, most eyes globally have been focused on Gaza and what's happening there, uh, but the conditions in the West Bank and the continued growth and construction of new settlement uh, has been unparalleled and, frankly, horrific. Um, but you are not here to hear me talk about it. You are here to hear Hagit talk about it. So with that, I will say, Hagit, hello. Thank you again for joining us. And please tell us more about the report and tell us more about what is happening um, in the West Bank. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for arranging this and having me. Um, yeah, um, as a Settlement Watch person, I'm very, very busy uh, in uh, recent days, weeks, months. Um, it is all the time developing. New things are happening. Uh, it's uh, hard to follow, um, but we are doing our best. Um, and when we we did this uh, summary for 2023, it was um, really a record year for so many things in settlements. It's, uh, of course, the approval of plans and promotion of, of new units in West Bank settlements. It's a score year for since we started to to follow that uh, number of new outposts that were established in in one year it was 26 new outposts that we count um, and already since the end of uh, 2023 there are another um, five or six new outposts already uh, and there were 26 last year so it's it's um, it's a record year 
um, approval of outposts. Um, 15 outposts went through uh, at least one stage of, of, uh, of approval. Uh, and the promotion of, of and development of roads is also um, dramatic. And um, and so, yeah, a lot of things that are going on right now on uh, on the ground in the West Bank. Thanks. Madeline, you want to kick us off? Yeah, thank you so much. So obviously things are terrible, as you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit more about the factors that are contributing to this rise in, um, you know, the establishment of outposts and the advancement of construction plans? And particularly, has anything um, in your estimation changed post October 7th? Yeah, um, I think the the main powers to to do all all those uh, changes on the ground is are the the government powers uh, we have the most right wing government that we ever had and specifically the um, coalition of netanyahu now he's so dependent on ben gvir and smotrich who are far far right smotrich um, Minister Smotrich specifically, he's uh, is a settler. He's a um, very talented and understanding how things work, and he had a, a big plan, and he knows what he wanted to accomplish, and he managed to get a lot of of uh, things that he wanted. And many changes. Uh, I did not mention the change. Um, which is we we called it a, a, an annexation or a, the euro annexation that took place uh, during this year, and it was changes in the way the uh, government is managing settlements. Officially, as you know, it's occupied territories, and it's not supposed to be managed by the government of Israel. Uh, the international law uh, sets the norms how how to manage occupied territories, and it should be done by the military. And the military should consider the interests of the population of the, in our case, of the Palestinians. However, what Smotrich has done was, and it's not Smotrich; it's the government, but he is leading this. He managed to uh, civilize the management of settlements, meaning that is many, many aspects of the administration of settlements is now um, reporting directly to him, to the minister. And the people who are in charge of it are not officers in the military. They are uh, civil servants, servants of the Israeli government, they legally, they need to consider the interests of the Israelis. And this is, um, although you can say, well, it was always the government to to pull the strings and to, to decide what's going on in the West Bank, this is true. However, now, um, uh, and the military would do what the, the government asked it to, to do. But now that you have those people who are in charge of settlements and they are political um, people uh, reporting to Smotrich, including the legal advisor, uh, this is a, a change that uh, we are starting to see the change on the ground. And I'm sure if it's not, it will not change soon. We will see more of, of those changes in the near future on the ground. So that goes right actually into what I was going to ask you, um, which is a, a legality question. Right. So we know, you know, under international law, settlements are all illegal. But even under Israeli law, there are, you know, illegal out outposts. Um, so now, because of what you're just saying, I've got a two part question. So the first part is, you know, what what's the criteria the government uses to decide how to legalize those? Because obviously often they are retroactively legalized, but it goes in 
I think, exactly to what you were just talking about, because that difference between having the military administer the settlement enterprise versus having the government do it isn't just a, a bureaucratic difference, right? It's a legal difference, because under the international law, it is the military occupation that that has the responsibility for what happens there. So in fact, I mean, legally, you, you said it, in, in some ways it is a an act of annexation to now have the civilian government administering that role. Exactly, Hadar, it is, um, we're seeing along the years, the incremental annexation of, of, uh, of the West Bank, um, and it's, I think now it moved a big uh, step forward and, um, you know, taking down some of the last um, places or focal points where you could have some kind of restraint over the wish of the settlers or the government or the Israelis in terms of the admin administrating uh, the West Bank and, and the settlement. So it is uh, dramatic, and I think legally, and uh, we are we are all um, so interested in what's going on in the in the co uh, international court in the Hay, but there there is also the the previous uh, legal file against Israel in the ICC, and and there we are uh, in big trouble. I mean, settlements are illegal, as you said, and now we are even doing it in a more um, blatant way. I don't know how to say, um, yeah. And I wanna go, just go back to the first part of that question about the, the legalizing, the retroactive legalizing. Oh, yes, yes, I forgot that. Um, I asked two questions, that's on me. <laughs> yeah, um, outposts uh, um, are the method that actually started when Netanyahu was elected uh, in 1996, after Israel said, uh, we said we're going to peace, we, we had Oslo agreement, and so it's not reasonable that Israel will establish new settlements. Uh, so since then, Israel is not establishing new settlements, but it's happening by itself. It's on the ground and it's considered illegal. And um, however, throughout the years, the government started to retroactively legalize those illegal outposts and already managed to, to legalize uh, at least 23 of them or even more, I don't remember by heart. And this year they moved forward with with the legalization of another 15. Um, the legalization will include, uh, first of all, making sure that the land, you have some rights to the land. Usually it means to make them state land. Um, and then the, uh, the putting the, the jurisdiction or setting a, um, the the limits for for the for the new settlement a government decision to establish this new settlement and then the planning process to allow the construction and each um, outpost or each settlement is being promoted uh, in different uh, uh, levels uh, right now uh, today we're just you know uh, uploading uh, our update for another outpost that is now being uh, legalized by uh, setting a new jurisdiction for an outpost called Achia near Shiloh settlement uh, at the heart of the West Bank where they are now putting a new jurisdiction so that after this jurisdiction is completed uh, the plan they can file a plan to legalize the outpost. But I think these phenomena, it's its dramatic, it's important. Uh, I think that what um, is 
more urgent now is the the relatively new phenomena of the last few years of outposts that are actually agriculture farms that are actually um, places where you have more and more um, attacks by those settlers against Palestinians. And in 2023, there were at least 21 Palestinian communities that um, were displaced from their homes following the threats and attacks by settlers and also the pressure that they get from, from the Israeli army and from the authorities. And last week, I have visited uh, a Palestinian uh, community when they were packing and uh, uh, running away from a settler that established a new outpost. It's near uh, the settlement of Ma'ale Ephraim. It's uh, in the Jordan Valley. There is a Palestinian community there called uh, Asukhun, and they were packing and they were running away from this guy who's who came there 10 days before and established a farm where brought a few a few sheep uh, and he is uh, put up a actually he, he brought a bus he lives in a bus there and uh, he has um, threatened them and said, told them if you're not leaving by the end of this week you will be harmed and some of the families uh, got the message and, and uh, ran away immediately. Then a few days later came a military unit to do a, a search in in the in this community, you know, go into their homes and searching for I don't know what and made them stand out in the rain for many hours. And they realized and also, they had a pipeline from the nearby spring that was cut. And when they, after they um, fixed it, the 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 pipe was t not taken away. So they realized they they don't stand a chance. And then, two days before I met them, there was a Palestinian shepherd who was killed not far from them, not in the same community, but not far from them. Uh, after some argument with settlers, then uh, the, the army came and uh, shot him. The Palestinians say it, he didn't do anything. He was just, you know, standing there. Uh, the army said they, that the soldiers felt under threat, so they shot him. So it's very, very tense. And of course, since uh, October 7, the the level of violence, the intensity of the violence against Palestinians is much, much higher. Uh, we see uh, another very important change, which uh, has to do with the military. Um, before 7th of October, most of the settlements were guarded by uh, one or two guards that are ci civilians that are funded by, by the Ministry of Defense, but they're civilians, usually settlers who live there. And a bunch of, of settler volunteers who are ready in case of emergency to take the guns and and go and protect the settlement. Now, after what happened in, in 7th of October, the attacks on uh, localities and on houses inside Israel, of course, people were terrified of what might happen in the West Bank. So the, the army recruited um, settlers to be um, the guards of the settler, settlements. And now you have a unit of 
in each settlement, I don't know, maybe 10 soldiers, most of them live in the settlement or in nearby settlement. They are reserved soldiers, so they get the uniform, they get the, the weapon from the IDF, but there are settlers who live there. And some of, of those um, soldiers are part of the mechanism that is pushing away Palestinians. And suddenly, Palestinians who know a settler who is harassing them when they are out in their fields, suddenly he's coming with the uniform and weapon. And, and in some cases, it, it had to do with more harsh attacks. And suddenly, it's not uh, the settler violence, but it's military uh, violence. And those um group uh, they they are now on reserve duty so all day they don't go to work they are there to guard so what do they do all day they patrol and then if it, they're bored or if they think it's important they will go out to a patrol to the next uh, next door village to make sure there are no threats or whatever and you can imagine or, or you can hear what it means um, sometimes for the Palestinians, for, for their sense of security and the threats they feel. So we have more than 1,000 Palestinians who uh, fled, uh, ran away from the threats of the settlers and sometimes settlers in uniform. And that's a dramatic, dramatic uh, um, development. That's horrifying. And I want to get into the issue of settler violence in a little bit. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the displacement of Palestinian communities and the fragmentation of Palestinian territory um, and how the construction of an expansion of roads and settlements has contributed to that. Um, and also, if you could tell us if Israel has taken any steps to mitigate the negative effects of settlement roads on Palestinian lives? What we see from all governments of, of Israel in recent years was um, total support of, of uh, the settlers. And there are now, um, you know, it's hard to say how many uh, farms or outpost uh, already is around 100 of them uh, and outpost another 100 so it's it's almost 200 uh, such outposts and and if there was a, a, even a small political will to block them then it was very easy to to uh, block them They're, the military knows exactly where they are they know exactly what they do and but they allow them to be there and not only do they allow them to be there, they support them. They support them in so many ways. Um, each of the municipalities in the West Bank get funds for um, something that is called protection of state land. Now, protection of state land is the co code name for displacing Palestinians or kicking out Palestinians from the area. Um, so those settlers who establish a farm, who go out to the field all, all the time to, to uh, um, threaten Palestinian farmers to not come near, etc., they are supported by this project that the government is is funding through those municip through the municipalities of the settlements. You have the um, support that is coming through direct uh, budgets that are given to shepherds. Uh, we just uh, completed the report that exposes that the government. Uh, supported those illegal farms directly, gave money to, to those settlers with more than 1.6 million shekels in the last six years. Um, in addition 
to support they get through volunteers that are funded again by the Ministry of Agriculture. So the government is uh, supportive of, of this action, although officially they will tell, uh, tell you that it's illegal and that it's not approved or, or whatever. But it's uh, like I, I like to say, um, settler violence is not a bug, it's, it's a feature. It's, it's part of the, the effort that the government by the settlers is taking to take over land in, in area C and to displace or to kick the Palestinians out of area C. Thank you. Um, that was a two-part question, so I'm sorry for bugging you on this one again, but um, I'd love to hear more about the way in which the roads themselves kind of carve up area C and, and make life um, infinitely more difficult in addition to the settlements. Yeah, so there are two kinds of, of roads I would like to, to talk about. One kind is something that, you know, I've been uh, monitoring settlements with peace now um, for 18 years now, I've never seen such a uh, development um, and, uh, like I see today. It's almost every day that we see new roads that are being opened, um, paved. It's usually dirt roads um, somewhere in the hills uh, that settlers open. And these roads are, of course, illegal. Um, and they are dramatic because when you have an access road that you can go to an area fast, uh, you can easily uh, reach new hills and new places and kick out farmers from, from it. And sometimes they are used as a kind of a um, a border to mark to mark the border where Palestinians are allowed or not allowed. And of course, after you have a road open, then it's possible to bring the the bus or the caravan or whatever to to uh, to build a new presence, a new farm, a new outpost. So that's one kind of of uh, development that we're seeing on the ground all the time. It's not uh, easy to, you know, to, to map all, the, all of them, but we know where they are and in general, uh, uh, how they, they look. And the other kind of, of roads, this is more systematic and, and more, I think, dramatic in terms of the possibility to expand settlements. Uh, and that's, the main roads, the bypass roads that the government is uh, uh, developing. It, it started several years ago with uh, the government approving billions of shekels to development of main roads in the West Bank. All of them are meant to allow um, better um, com commuting for settlers because most of the settlers work in Israel and they commute every day. And there is an amount of, of cars that those, the existing roads can take. And there are a lot of uh, traffic jams in, in the West Bank, uh, or at least in the roads leading to Israel from settlements. And in order to be able to develop and build more and attract more settlers, you need better roads, you need more lanes, and you need more bypass road to bypass uh, Palestinian uh, villages, uh, etc. So what we're seeing is a huge amount of, of money, even after the cuts that took place in the, the budget because of the war, still we have 3 billion shekels for roads in in settlements, just to understand 
uh, 3 billion shekels for new roads uh, are 20% of the road budget of Israel. And as you probably know, there are only 5% of the Israelis who live in the West Bank in settlements, but they get now budgets of 20% of the budget of, of developing worlds. And, and this is something dramatic because when they complete those roads, the development of the settlements will almost automatically come because it's a it's a it's a economy um natural development when you have good road it's becoming a better suburb for to to move um actually we looked at the bypass road that was opened in 2008 um west uh, east of of bethlehem it's called the liberman road leading to four settlements and in less than 10 years those settlements doubled and that's what the settlers want to achieve with the current development and, and unfortunately an yes uh, but it's not an accident that's that's why they're building no, those roads. no no it's not it's not an accident even um you know on on um i think it was friday or thursday that there was an a terrorist attack uh, near a settlement called Dolev, and the reaction of the minister Smotrich and the minister of transportation Regev, they jointly announced that they are now promoting a road, a bypass road that leads to the settlement, and it's a whole new road um, that is um, in an area where you don't have still Israeli presence in the West Bank, west of Ramallah, uh, that will dramatically shorten the the road from those settlements, Dolev, Talmon, and area to Jerusalem. And uh, it's dramatic. Uh, if you're interested in that, we just published uh, an update on, on this announcement too. Thank you, Chagid. So, uh... There, there's so much. I have there. I have a lot of questions, um, but given all of my questions, I'm actually going to take take one that was submitted here, um, which is maybe trying to look at uh, some future options and solutions. So the question the question here, I'm reading it out of our Q and A, is what would be the best strategy for reversing the current wave of settlement expansion? Um, would it include returning supervision of the settlements to the military, budget restrictions by the Israeli government, and then of course the questions about uh, external pressure, including the the U.S. sanctions and actually now European sanctions that we're seeing um, being placed on the moment, it's it's particularly violent settlers. And part of that, and I'm obviously referencing President Biden's executive order from last month. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about do you do you think do you think the impact of that is being felt in the settlements yet? And yeah, I'll stop there. Um... I think there's no real question of how you can you stop settlements because um, it's so simple. It's a political decision. All settlements are directly controlled by by the the government. It's occupied territories. It's even not a, like a development in Israel where you can say there is some you know private interests that you cannot stop them from developing. It's not. It doesn't exist in in the West Bank. It's all under direct control of the government. So as soon as there is a political, uh, any political will, uh, the action is, is very clear. And, and I can, you know, start and list what what you can do in order to stop settlements or, uh, or even limit a, a, the development. Um, but of course, the question is, how do you get political will to do it? And maybe remind me this question, because I think it's important. Um, but uh, one thing that we see again and again in in polls, and especially in in recent months, is that in most Israelis, they hate the violent settlers. I mean, hate meaning that they feel they don't like it, they don't support it. They, it's the most far image that they can find for for themselves and uh, and i think uh, it is important to, to remember that because you think well you have itamar bengvir who is a violent settler himself 
um, as a minister. Um, so you imagine that they have a lot of support in Israel, but I think the the very uh, the violent acts, and we saw it even before uh, October seven, are um, not supported by Israelis. But before October seventh, people didn't care about it or didn't hear about it because it's. Well, I I don't want to go into all the reasons why our issue was so not interesting in not on the agenda before uh, 7th of October. Uh, but now it's different. Now uh, the Palestinian issue is on the table and it's on in the discourse in Israel and of course in so many um, aspects now. But the settler violence is something that um, I think most Israelis, now they start to hear about it because it's also constituent um, um, security threat because they are trying to set fire also in the West Bank. And we have enough, you know, in Gaza and in the North, and we don't want to have another front in the West Bank. So even you can hear from the military and from some uh, security people how the the violent settlers are a threat. And here, I think that the American move of, of sanctions is, is dramatic. It, it is very dramatic, although it did not uh, uh, end, you know, it did not bring a huge backlash in, in Israel and you didn't hear uh, too much uh, um, argument about it, except from the settlers themselves that are saying, how come and we are a democratic state and how can there is intervention as if settlements is an is a internal issue of Israel. I mean, Israelis really don't understand that it's occupied territory. Or inside of a democratic state for that matter, but yes. Oh yeah, well, right, also that. But, um, uh, and it's not funny. Um, but I said it was dramatic. First of all, what we hear is that, for instance, the minister Smotrich is like putting hours and hours of his time trying to to fight or to find a solution or how to counter those sanctions because it's serious. It's um, it's really a, a game changer in ter terms of um, what the the settlers can do and what the government can do and all you know all the banking system um can do and i think it was a very smart move because it's not you know they are not uh, sanctioning the state of israel for all the bad deeds that the government is doing and it's not punishing the whole society but they say uh, the, the American administration is saying with a clear, clear message that settler violence is not acceptable. And if you are a violent settler, we don't want to to have any uh, any kind of connection to you. And you you cannot uh, have a bank account in in America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it means also that you cannot have a bank account in Israel. So. I think we are yet to see all the implications of that, and uh, and I think it's it's very important. But I don't want us to expect that oh now the government will start chasing those settlers and uh, stop all all the settlement activity. We need to first of all remember who is in our government and who is our prime minister and and who they think they serve, who is their base. Um, but um, but it's, it's, it might become more and more problematic for them to support it. And uh, so I think it's uh, something that is uh, encouraging. Although 
it is a very, you know, far reaching move, you know, to to rule against the person, you know, without the court, etc. But um but this is very, very important. Thank you. I want to spend a little more time on those sanctions. And we have a question in the chat that um, kind of kicks us off about how they could be expanded um, without involving Congress um, and kind of the impact of these sanctions. So I'll, I'll just I'll just start here, then I'll ask you a question if you don't mind. Um, number one, we've already seen an expansion of these sanctions, and I think that's really exciting, um, but just um, losing track of time now. But I think the last two weeks, I want to say two weeks ago, um, you know, the second round of sanctions was issued. And this time, instead of just targeting individuals to farm outposts, we're also wrapped up in those sanctions. So the way that this executive order is crafted allows for a lot of um, flexibility on behalf of the administration. So it, it, it kind of extends, not the sky is the limit, but but somewhere, you know, in the, the atmosphere is the, is the limit here. Um, you know, the president could, if they're willing, go so far as to sanction those who are promoting settlements, not just settlers or promoting settler violence. So, you know, if you're saying, I'd like to see another Huara um, and you're a government minister, you would, you know, possibly fall under those sanctions if the government chooses, if the United States government chooses to act. Um, so it really is um, a nimble little thing we have now. Um, to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, these types of efforts. I know you talked a bit about whether or not, you know, how um, how Smotrich has been um, dealing with it. And I also want to talk a bit about the Pompeo Doctrine and the reversal of that, which came at the end of February. But I think we've seen now a couple different um, signals from the US administration that they're taking this seriously and they're taking this increasingly seriously. Um, so yeah, could you talk maybe a little bit more about how the reaction to the Pompeo Doctrine was over in Israel and if that you know you think could have any other impact? Oh, and sorry, just to be clear, the Pompeo Doctrine was, um, you know, something that uh, Secretary of State Pompeo issued at the very end of the Trump years. Um, it was actually after Biden was elected and it basically said settlements are no longer illegal in the US eyes. Um, so this reversal is a return to a very longstanding policy on the illegality of settlements. Yeah, well, um, I think if it were canceled, you know, on time, um, way before 7th of October, this would become a big argument in the Israeli media and people would uh, discuss uh, settlements are illegal, not legal, etc. Uh, and what the Americans are doing to us or whatever. But now this passed, I think, quietly with no public attention in Israel. Uh, you know, we have so much on on our heads now and of course security 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 and we have corrupt government and we have um hostages i mean uh, this really passed with with no no public attention at all in terms of the internal public debate in Israel. And I think it's not really, it's not dramatic. You know, it's almost a given that settlements are illegal. But in terms of, you know, the American stand uh, for settlements, and it has to do also with, you know, other organi international organizations, etc. It's, uh, it's very important. It was really uh, essential to to go back to to this basic uh, notion that settlements are illegal and that are um, bad for Israel and for the chances for any stability here. So, to follow up on that a little bit, um, a couple of things that we we saw happen this week. So you mentioned, well, I mentioned at the beginning the twenty twenty three settlement report, and then you mentioned. There's even the newer report, the uh, 
about the Ministry of Agriculture uh, allocating funds to those illegal farm outposts. So I want to ask you to tell folks a little bit about that outpost, about that report, and I'm going to connect with it um, the other piece of news we saw this week, which was Smotrich's declaration of 8,000 dunums right, in the Jordan Valley as state land, which is the biggest sort of land grab, I think, since the Oslo Accords. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, again, you know, we've been talking about little illegal outposts that happen here, how this is happening, a settler takes this action. But both of these are not actions by individual settlers or some, you know, rogue body. Both of these are government actions, right? The Department of Agriculture has been, or the Ministry of Agriculture has been funding these illegal, illegal outposts, and we're seeing this massive land grab. Um, tell us a little bit about both, if you will, and also, if, do you think that there is, you know, a particular reason that they're doing this now as opposed to before? Why, or, or do you think we just, you know, found out about it more now? Yeah, well, in terms of of the the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, assistance to to those uh, uh, outposts. This is something that is ongoing, um, at least for six years that we know of, and we only found out now. Um, the um, the pretext for that is that the government or the Ministry of Agriculture want to encourage the preservation of open spaces open areas uh, through grazing of land. And it has some uh, ecological uh, and uh, environmental uh, reasoning. And it is, uh, and so if you have um, a flock, I don't know, of, of cows or of sheep or then, and you graze it in open areas and you have enough of, enough heads of, of sheep or whatever, you might get uh, some kind of, uh, some amount of, of money uh, for for doing that, for grazing open areas. Uh, and this is something that is happening inside Israel. But what we found that this these funds are also going to uh, individual farms or farmers uh, in the West Bank, including for instance, a person called the Neria Ben Pazi, who got a few dozens of thousands of shekels from Ministry of Agriculture, and he is now sanctioned. And his farm is also sanctioned uh, now under um, by the Americans. This means, of course, that this year he's he cannot receive funding from the government unless the government would want to risk our money with, with uh, sanctions. So I believe that um, he's not going to, to get this direct support. They might find ways to bypass it, but not directly. Hagid, can you just, sorry to interrupt, but can you speak to that for a second about the material support, right? Why the government can't fund him because he's been sanctioned? Well, that that's, I believe you you know better, I mean, the, the system of this san sanction Right. But but you you can explain it. All right, so I'll add in a sentence that. So just to make to, to make that clear, you know, when the U.S. government has implemented these sanctions on the individuals or on the the outposts, any other individual or body that is funding them, right, is is subject to uh, is then could be subject to being sanctioned themselves because of what, what's referred to as material support. Because they are are they are supporting the sanctioned individual. You usually hear that phrase "material support" thrown around when people are talking about people who are funding Hamas or Hezbollah or terror organizations. But it's the same idea. If an individual or institution has been sanctioned, if you then fund that individual, um, you yourself run the risk of sanctions. Which is again the that's really the power and the broad reach of what those sanctions can do. So okay, back to you. Yeah, so so um, it's just another example of of how how um, the the government really supports this. It's not a fringe idea, and it's not by accident that you have so many of those outposts uh, all around the West Bank taking over 
hundreds of thousands of dunams um, in the, in recent years. It's it's all backed by by the government directly and of course indirectly in many uh, mechanisms that we only understand part of them, I believe. Um, yeah, and as for for your uh, second question about declare declaration on state land, declaration on state land is a tool that Israel has been using in order to take over Palestinian lands in the West Bank through a very draconian uh, interpretation of of the Ottoman law, saying that if land is not cultivated for several years, then it becomes the public uh, property, uh, what is called in Israel state land. And this way, during the 80s, um, the government surveyed the lands in the West Bank and declared on thousands of dunams, said now it's not private anymore, it's now uh, our, our land or gov government land or public land. And by the way, public land is supposed to be um, allocated to the public, and the public in the West Bank happens to be Palestinian. However, the occupying power, uh, also known as Israel, is not al allocating those lands to Palestinians. Only uh, less than a quarter of percent of the lands that were allocated were allocated for Palestinians, and most of it was allocated for them so that they will move to, to another place to allow this expansion of a settlement. So it's really a means of taking over Palestinian land. And when uh, Yitzhak Rabin was elected in 1992, he stopped that. And the Declaration on State Land stopped um, uh, until 1998 when Netanyahu was the prime minister. And they started, you know, every year, um, not even every year, to declare here and there um, some uh, um, lands as state lands. And what we see this year in 2024 is already a record um, uh, in that. Uh, we had two declarations of uh, around 10,000 um, dunams um, almost. And in total, we have already 40,000 uh, dunams that were declared and taken over uh, by by the government since since uh, Rabin, since Netanyahu renewed that. So, yeah, we see all the means are ongoing or renewing under this government uh, in order to take over the West Bank. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat that I want to get to, and I know we're short on time. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and answer one before I ask you the other question. Um, we had a question about the extent that settlements, either roads or otherwise, are funded with American money. Um, and then a question about whether or not, um, if that is the case, why doesn't Biden cut off money? So um, one, no, settlement construction is not funded by U.S. tax dollars. However, as we were kind of getting to with the as Hadar were getting to with the conversation around the executive order a bit, um, there are you know nonprofits um, and other charitable groups that raise money for settlements in the United States, um, and supposedly you know say one of those settlements is considered to be, um, you know, under sanctions, right? And this, um, you know, a, a launch pad for violent settlers, then, yeah, then they could end up finding themselves sanctioned as well. Um, so that ha hasn't happened yet. That has not been determined. And there have been no, um, you know, sanctions against settlements that are funded by the United States, from what I understand, or by Americans, from what I understand. But that is, you know, within the realm of possibility should um, the president choose to take it that way. Um, okay, then we have a question about the um, statistics and demographics, I should say, of Israelis living in the settlements. 5% um, of Israelis live in settlements from what you said. Hagit, that seems like a small number given all the incidents and negativity of the issue. 
Can you elaborate on that number as a percentage of Israeli demographic statistics and the future growth trends given typically high birth rates um, for Orthodox citizens? And follow up there, is it documented anywhere in the current government where it stands or panders as to metrics and whether or not more outposts are going to be authorized per year as we look ahead? The, the growth uh, in, in settlement population is, is higher, uh, the growth rate is higher than in Israel. However, it's slowing down. Um, and it's interesting, like I think 10 years ago, it would be three or three and a half or four percent every year. And now it's around the two, two and a half or something like that. And that, that's that's important to remember that um, although the the government is putting a lot of um, efforts to bring settlers and to 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 make it more impossible to undo, it's not that the Israeli public is is standing in the line in order to to go there. It's be, it it has become less and less. Um, the average Israeli kind of settlers that used to be in the past. Now it's mostly ideologically motivated settlers and there are enough of them, uh, but it's still not the, the masses. So we can be a, a little you know, hopeful that from the fact that it's not much, much bigger than, than what the, the settler would, would wish, but again, if you are able to build good roads and to build a suburb close to Jerusalem, where I can, in in the money that I spend for two rooms in 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 the city, I can have five rooms and a garden, ten minutes drive from from my work, then Israelis might move there, and that's why they still have growth in, in settlements. And of course, there is also the ultra-Orthodox um, cities, uh, settlements that are um, growing um, all the time. Uh, so this is, um, so that's that's for the, the statistics. Um, maybe it's a, it's a good way of, of saying that uh, we're not doomed here. And uh, although it, it seems very hard to, to undo the, the settlements, I think still um, I get encouraged by the fact that still today, the majority of Israelis, they don't support the settlements as such. I mean, it, it is more that they don't care for them. And therefore, when we are able to get to a reality where there is a peace agreement where it, there is an arrangement um, that that will be the time where the majority of Israelis will will say we support it or will say we always supported it. And uh, and I think we're, we're not doomed here, but we have to push very strongly in order to get to that moment. And I think the, the 7th of October with all this horrible horrible situation and uh, the thousands of thousands of Palestinians that are killed and the thousands of Israelis that are killed um, is also an opportunity because our issue is back on the table. Israelis cannot ignore it anymore. And we are getting to the moment of, of choice. Of, and, and there is actually only one one reasonable choice. I mean, there there is the Ben Gvir choice who's saying, okay, kick out all the Palestinians, but this is not where most Israelis are at. And, and I believe that it's not going to happen maybe tomorrow morning, but uh, this is now the time not to give up and to put our utmost efforts to to bring the the Israelis uh, and the Palestinians into a process that would lead to this um, two states um, reality or two states uh, solution that will bring us peace. And I I believe it's possible. Thank you, Chagi. 
Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for all of the work that you are doing. Um, thank you for en ending it on that note, which I appreciate. By the way, tomorrow morning would be fine with me for the record, but um, even if it is not tomorrow morning, we will all continue, continue to work, continue to work for this. Um, thank you, Madeline. And thank you, everybody, for joining us.